Well, it's wonderful to see you all here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. So what does it mean to be human? Now, as the head of the School of Humanities, that question is very apt because in the humanities, we assume that there is something unique and meaningful about being human. But I'm not sure these days how trendy it is to actually be human. If you look at a film like Avatar, it seems that it might be better not to be human. In fact, it might be even more humane to be an alien. So for those of us here who are humans, uh, there seems to be a crisis of faith about who we are. But maybe that's a question that's been asked through the centuries. And this evening, we're going to explore this question from a Judeo-Christian perspective that has shaped the meaning of humanity for at least 4,000 years now. And I can't think of a better person to explore this issue than the speaker for this evening, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, who is currently a lecturer at the University of Oxford. Not only is he a scholar with many books to his name, but he's a great communicator that has been invited to speak on issues that really matter in strategic places of leadership across the world, including the White House, the Peruvian government, the Lenin Military Academy, the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow, the UN, and the University of Hong Kong. So, of course. <laughs> So it's really it's a great honor and a privilege to have him back here in this university to speak to us this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Thank you, for Thank you Professor Chua. And uh, <clears throat> I often think of what uh, Chuck Colson has said whenever they've invited him, oftentimes they've asked him to speak on the depravity of man. And he was beginning to wonder why they were always asking him to speak on human depravity, uh, whether it was because he himself had been quite depraved in his years gone by, or whether it was just a theoretical subject. So you will find out tonight that I am very human, and that makes it my only qualification to try and address this subject. If my voice sounds a little bit weak, it is because I am coming off about a 10 or 12 days of rest. I was with my wife. We were going through four or five countries, and um, I suppose I shouldn't say this, but I may as well say it, although it's not true, that when I'm with my wife, I just listen, and she talks. So I will actually, what I want to say to you is when I don't use my voice for extended periods of time, it really does clamp up on me and we were both in a reading and listening to lectures, having a great time, went through uh, the Grand Canaries and then on through Morocco, through Casablanca and Agadir and uh, ended up in Lisbon and Madeira and so on. So we had a great time and my voice got an awful lot of rest after some very, very hectic months and intense months of speaking. <clears throat> so if it sounds a little weak, it is just because it has been unused for a little while, and uh, by the time I finish my four days in Hong Kong, it'll be back to full strength. So be not dismayed. I will have my voice back. Maybe that might be a reason for dismay and may make my talks a little longer as the week goes by. Many of you are thinking on these things. You ask these questions, and... Um, Certainly, you would not be here in the middle of the week if it was not of some interest to you. Whether you're sympathetic to the approach or not, at least to hear the perspective on how the Judeo-Christian worldview frames the question of humanity. I was thinking even this afternoon, rather in an intriguing way, you know, the word uh, in Hindi for man is admi which I have little doubt has been translated, for, transliterated, I should say, from the word Adam. There has to be the major radicals that have been taken over from there, whether the linguistic crossover comes or however it came to be, all the way from uh, 
an ancient use of a term all the way to the time of uh, Hindi speaking people. When they talk of a man, they will talk about Admi. There was a very famous Indian song when I was growing up as uh, a youngster in Delhi. It went like this in Hindi, and if I may quote it for you, first in Hindi, and if any one of you speaks it, you'll track it immediately, and then I'll translate it for you. It says this, Name Bhagwan hu, Name Shaitan hu, Socho yo dinia wale, Meto insan hu. What it's really saying is this, I'm not a god, Name Bhagwan hu, Bhagwan is the word for God. Name Shaitan hu, again the word for Satan and Shaitan, almost transliterated once more. Name Bhagwan hu, Name Shaitan hu, I'm not a god, I am not an evil one. Listen, O people of this world, Meto insan hu, I am a human being. Isn't it fascinating that we don't call ourselves human doings? We call ourselves human beings, which lifts off from the concept of essence to existence and not the other way around. The existentialists found their meaning in their doing, in the expression of their will and volition and passion. And for the existentialist to be authenticated, he or she had to do in order to be. But we define ourselves as human beings and we do not believe existence precedes essence as the existentialist would, but implicitly we believe that essence precedes existence in the very terms we use for our description. Some of you may have heard me tell the story some years told by Bishop John Reed of the Sydney Diocese of Australia. He was telling it in a completely different context, but I thought it was a marvelous description of the human predicament, especially in this postmodern world. He talked about these two English uh, Australian sailors who had just arrived on British soil and they were wandering around through the dark hours looking for a pub. And they found one and got in there and began to consume the liquid refreshment being offered there. And they went through several hours of this and finally, quite inebriated, they got onto their feet and stepped into a dense London fog. Quite disoriented as they looked around, uh, they didn't know where they were and they waited and waited and a very highly decorated English naval officer was seen approaching the pub with all of his medals flashing on his chest. And one of the Aussie sailors said to him, say you bloke, do you know where we are? And the English naval officer rather offended at this disrespect said to them, do you men know who I am? At which point one Aussie said to the other, we are really in a mess now. We don't know where we are and he doesn't know who he is. You know, the story is told of Muhammad Ali flying in a plane that hit moderate turbulence. Now, if you're hitting moderate turbulence, it's time to perform the last rites emotionally. Mild turbulence, you can handle. Moderate turbulence means even the flight attendants are looking very nervous at that point. And this plane hit rather moderate turbulence and the pilot came on and asked the passengers to please fasten their seat belts. Everybody complied except Muhammad Ali, the world heavyweight boxing champion. The flight attendant came to him and said, sir, would you please fasten your seat belt? To which he said, Superman don't need no seat belt. And she promptly responded by saying, Superman don't need no airplane either. <clears throat> Here we are in the year 2010, thinking of ourselves as Supermen. We don't even want to be defined by the term modernity anymore. We are postmodern. We are after the very landmark towards which we were moving. And it is not in any unintended way into given, giving us that liberty to shred the skin of modernity, give up on logic and give up on design and give up on anything of order in this universe 
and ultimately make up our own rules and our own logic. Isn't it interesting that the film Avatar, which sees the military as a destructive force, comes from Hollywood, which has probably done more to dehumanize humanity. In all of its value systems, in the violence it promotes gratuitously for entertainment, and the sensuality the broken lives of their celebrities represent the worldview by which they live. It comes to us in the form of giving science the name of grace. How can science be coupled with grace unless metaphysics has something to say to physics? Unless a transcending worldview is the glue that gives us our commonality rather than giving it some fanciful name that binds you to the horse that you're riding. I want you to listen carefully how it is that the worldview of the Judeo-Christian is framed and I will be so audacious as to tell you this. In my thinking, I do not know of any other worldview that has both systemically and systematically not only dealt with the answers to our questions, but has legitimized the questions. Outside of the Judeo-Christian worldview, I'm afraid many of the questions actually get delegitimized. We ask questions from a paradigm that is outside of the worldview from within which we are asking it. We ask questions of good and evil. How does a naturalist really even define those terms? And so we have to think these things through very, very carefully. Actually, the first time I was asked to speak on this subject was at Johns Hopkins University. I was the um, only Christian evangelical voice in that, although from the Christian perspective, even Francis Collins was there, but he was a addressing it as uh, one of those who was so well recognized in the field of uh, uh, DNA research and so on. All the others were principally anti-theistic thinkers. And I thought when I first got the invitation, and not being uh, in any way um, derogatory of, of the plan of it, I think I lauded them. I think it was wonderful that it was done. But in my mind, I raised this question, isn't it fascinating that here we are trying to answer the question what it means to be human when we have departments of humanities in universities. We have books on humanism. How do we arrive at an ism if we do not understand the very subject of the ism? And so I, you know, was thinking, I wonder if dogs get together and have a conference to discuss the meaning of dogginess. You know, cats don't get into the act of which feline is more representative of being a cat than the others. Is the tiger the worst representation and the kitten at home the cutest one, the nicest of them all? We are the only ones who are asking for a definition. And we are doing the defining. So, if you cannot get outside your locked in humanity, can you really make any objective statements about what it means to be human? I'll try and answer this as I bring it to a close, but let me give you basically four broad categories of thought from which the Judeo-Christian worldview gives us our definition of humanity. And it is very important that we, that we do the punctuation right here and we do the progressive of progression of thought correctly here. You know, when you think about it, if you take a word like therapist, it brings relief to the person in pain. Whether you're a physiotherapist or a psychotherapist, you're dealing with therapy. 
But if you take the same word therapist and break it into two, it could become the rapist. There's a world of a difference between a therapist and the rapist. Where you put your punctuation marks and where words are broken up becomes significant. It's like the fellow who was reading the passage of scripture who justified his stealing from the Bible. He says, the Bible says, let him that stole steal. No more let him labor with his hands. And the professor said, that's not what it's saying. It says, let him that stole steal no more. Let him labor with his hands. He said, oh, I misread it. I read it as let him that stole steal. No more let him labor with his hands. What I want you to follow is that the links in the description are very critical within this paradigm. The first is this, the Judeo-Christian worldview starts with a created order. It starts with that. Now, I don't want to get bogged down on the process of it and the minutiae of it, but from the Judeo-Christian worldview, there is clearly a starting point of a personal, intelligent, relational first cause. If you look at the Greek world, when they started to talk about ethics, they talked basically in six terms, truth, beauty, goodness, liberty, equality, and justice. And whether you were Socrates or Plato or Aristotle, based on those big three, and you followed through in Greek thinking, when they talked about liberty, equality, justice, truth, beauty, goodness, the Greeks never ever anchored those qualities in a personal first cause. It always remained as ideas. It was the ideas that shaped the Greek thinking. And the whole idea of democracy and the rulership of the masses and so on were ideas. Plato would talk about the summum bonum, the supreme good. But that goodness was never ever rooted in a person. It was left to the Hebrews to talk about truth, beauty, goodness, liberty, equality, justice as intrinsic to and emerging from the person of God. That they were not abstract ideas, they were enveloped in a person. And you know it makes an awful lot of sense if for no other reason just think of one question that haunts us, the problem of evil. And in the problem of evil and suffering, whenever you phrase it, it is always either phrased by a person or with reference to a person. You never ever think of the idea of suffering unless a person raises the question or the person is raising the question about another person, which means personhood becomes intrinsically woven into the most fundamental question you and I ask. How can we raise that question in pure abstraction? So for the Judeo-Christian mindset, it emerges from and is lodged in the very nature and the person of God. Now we can argue all we want about the miracle or the absence of it. But two simple illustrations uh, I will use just to move away from that for now. You know, the story is told about this fellow who was fishing in a little pond. And every time he caught a tiny little fish, he put it into his bag. And when he caught a massive one, he threw it back. Another tiny little one, he put it into his bag. A huge one, he, threw, he would throw it back. An onlooker looked at him and said, can you explain this to me? Why is it you're keeping the small ones and throwing the big ones away? And the fellow said, unfortunately, at home I only have an 8-inch frying pan. And anything bigger than the 8 inches is no, of no use to me, so I throw it away. We talk of so many inexhaustible mysteries where human life itself is miraculous, but we throw away the big fish of the miracle and focus instead of the tiny little minutiae because it would take a theistic framework in order to explain it all. So rather than taking the theistic framework, we decide not to explain it at all and just leave it there. 
Francis Schaeffer used to give a beautiful little illustration. He said, if you left your home in the morning with a glass that we'll call glass A, and it had four ounces of water in it, and you went away for the day, and you came back and you noticed the glass that you had four ounces of water in it, the glass is now empty. But next to it, you see another glass, glass B. And you see B now has water in it, and A is empty. But you've got a second problem. B does not just have four ounces of water, it has eight ounces of water in it. He says, you can assume that the first four ounces came from glass A, but you will also have to explain where the other four ounces came from, because glass A could only explain four ounces of it, not the eight ounces of it. There is so much packed into human value and worth that naturalism at best can explain away four ounces of it. It still has to explain the other four ounces, some of which I want to bring to your attention tonight. The implication of a created order is this. Number one, you have intrinsic worth. This is not extrinsic worth. This is intrinsic value. This is a value that comes by virtue of your being essentially human. It is not given to you by a government. It is not given to you by any state. They may choose to give it to you or they may choose to take it away from you, but ultimately it is not their prerogative to define you as being essentially worthy or unworthy. Most of political theories that have arrogated to themselves this whole idea of worth as something that the state gives to you ends up often with unexplainable actions of dehumanizing the human beings in the process. You know, it is fascinating when I stand before American audiences within the atheistic framework, I say to them, explain to me these words within the Declaration of Independence. We consider these truths to be self-evident. What do they consider self-evident? That we are all created equal with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you realize there's no other worldview that could have written that statement? When I present this to US faculties, they're quiet. I said, look at the statement again. It is self-evident. It is not possible to deny it without affirming it at the same time. That's what it means. And what they're saying is that we are created equal, which means naturalism would not have said that. Pantheism would not have said that. The whole caste system, which is the big quest of Hindu philosophy, is an inequality in birth. Islam wouldn't have said that for the pursuit of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Think about it. These terms actually are the extension of the idea that you have intrinsic worth. But you cannot have intrinsic worth in a naturalistic framework. We're not all created equal. In fact, listen to the words of the atheist Friedrich Nietzsche, who, by the way, was an inspiration to Hitler. Nietzsche says this, equality is a lie concocted by inferior people who arrange themselves in herds to overpower those who are naturally superior to them. The morality of equal rights, says Nietzsche, is a herd morality because it opposes the cultivation of superior individuals. It leads ultimately to the corruption of the human species. Frederick Nietzsche, the atheist. The idea of equality is a herd mentality manufactured by inferior people who want to use their solid power to overcome those who are actually intellectually superior to them. And what Hitler was looking for, ultimately, was looking for the Superman, the Ubermensch, the superior human being who would do away with the weak of this world. 
So what the Judeo-Christian worldview first gives to you is your intrinsic worth. You know, I many times walk into places of incredible need. Incredible need. My life has taken me into those places. I remember about two years ago, two, three years ago, going into Chiang Mai in Thailand. I was going to try and find a project to support after I'd read in a newspaper article about this man from Japan who'd come into Thailand and he was teaching young people and children the art of Japanese silk weaving, saori weaving. And as I read the article, I realized this was not just teaching it to ordinary young people, it was teaching it to mentally deficient, principally the Down syndrome kids. I was so fascinated by this, I took a flight from Bangkok and flew into Chiang Mai and spent a morning there. And there was one guy there by the name of Tu, very heavy set, who was weaving away, you know, heavily concentrating on what he was doing and when he saw me standing there he came and asked me to sit down he would teach me what he knew and the, tea, the Japanese gentleman told me he said you know when they first come here their attention span is about one or two minutes he said this boy too keeps an eight hour day now and then his mother came up and she told me she was a single mom and this little boy was born the father abandoned them and left her to raise him. And he started to just feel destitute. She was doing her best to raise this young boy. And then she saw this place where this man had a burden for people like that. And he started to learn Japanese silk weaving. He was doing so well at it that tourists would come and would pay hundreds, yet thousands of dollars for his works. You know what his mother told me? Every time he gets a payment, he brings it to me and says, Mom, this is yours, because if it weren't for you, I would never be here today. Tell me, who taught this mentally deficient boy gratitude? Who taught him to pay his mother the greatest compliment of recognizing that even in his impoverished condition mentally, he was wealthy in the fundamentals of life, of love, and reciprocity, and gratitude. Intrinsic worth. Intrinsic worth. I often tell the story of my colleague Walter, who travels with me. Walter is originally from Peru. He has a five-year-old boy who's a little genius. And the fascinating thing about his son Andreas is that when Walter's wife Patricia was pregnant, the doctor looked at her and said, because of your age, and there's a surprise baby for them, 100% Down syndrome abort this child, 100%. No doubt about it. She said, if that's the case, that's fine. I still want to have my baby. And he kept putting pressure on her, so she changed doctors. And she had this little boy. Let me tell you something about this little boy. He's now five. Not too long ago, he was playing in our house, and he looks at his mother and says to her, God has spoken to me today and told me we should go and have lunch at Burger King. <laughs> she said, God's told you that? He said, yes. She said, God hasn't told me that. He comes around after a little while and says, does God always have to confirm with somebody else what he tells you? <laughs> the boy is five. One day he looked at his mother, Patricia, while they were coming to, her, to a meeting where they were holding downtown Atlanta, and he says to his father, isn't mommy looking beautiful today? And Walter, rather preoccupied, turned around and said, yeah, she is. He looks at him and says, no, 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 not like that. She's not your friend, she's your wife. Tell her nicely. 
he is about five years ahead of his class in his reading and his comprehension skills. The doctor had said 100% Down syndrome, eradicate him. Amazing, amazing that we really think we know so much that we have robbed the human being of his or her essential worth and essential dignity. So the implication of the created order, number one, is intrinsic worth. Number two is reflective splendor. Intrinsic worth, reflective splendor. There is a glory and there is a splendor that we are to reflect that is not merely our own, but we are endowed with and created with. It's, a, it's something that is transcending of you merely as an individual. It binds us to our fellow human beings. What is it that gives somebody the tremendous gift of musicianship? You watch somebody's fingers tickle the ivory and play music, and you see and listen to splendor somehow evoking within you a transcending gift that is reflective of something beyond just the person playing. When I was doing my research on a book that I was writing called Jesus, Jesus Talks to Hitler, I remember being in one of these death camps. I think we were in Book involved, and my colleague Stuart was with me. He's an expert in that genre of study. And I remember looking through the diary of a woman who was, had been in Buchenwald, and she talked about the fact that one day she had stepped out of her little cabin early to see if she could pick some worms from the soil. She was so hungry. And as she was picking the worms from the soil, she thought somebody was watching her, and she looked up and saw someone's face in the window, and she crouched and went away. And she kept doing this, but almost every time she was doing it outside a window, she saw this person looking at her. She said, it dawned on me suddenly. It was my reflection. I could not believe what I now looked like after being in this concentration camp. They had taken away from her the glory of the reflection even of her parents and instead had brought her down almost to the level of an animal. So you see, you and I need to think, A, what is the essential worth? Number two, what is the beauty we ultimately reflect? In the created order, there's intrinsic worth and there's reflective splendor. That is why the crime of racism is one of the worst kind of crimes, because you never, ever look down upon a person's ethnicity. There is a splendor in each ethnic group. And it is interesting when you read some of the authors that Darwin quoted in his book, you will see staggering statements like, there are the aboriginals of Ceylon, or of Australia that we would have to consider to be less than human. Staggering statements like that by German sociologists, biologists, thinkers, one of whom was a favorite with Darwin and he quoted him repeatedly. It was the natural flow of a frame of reference for this person for whom life was nothing more than bios, physiological life. There was no such thing as zoe, value-laden life intrinsically. And so we move from the created order and its implications to number two in the Judeo-Christian worldview. There is not only the creation, there is the incarnation. In the incarnation, the person of Jesus Christ is given to you and me. What the Bible says, you and I are to be conformed to the image of his son, the person of Christ. When you see the person of Christ represented in the scriptures, we read things like this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. You see the proximity of grace and truth 
in the person of Jesus spoken of in the Christian worldview <coughs> because of which I posit to you at least two logical conclusions. Number one, there is the absoluteness of the moral law in the person of God. The moral law is not relative. It is absolute in the person of God. Some time ago, a New York Times journalist was asked, uh, phoned to ask me about what I thought of all of this financial crisis globally and uh, what Christian leaders and philosophers were thinking about it. And I surprised him with a comment. I said, can I ask you one question before you ask me any of mine? He said, what is that? I think he was expecting to, me to ask him, will I be able to see the article before you print it or something like that. So I said to him, can you tell me why it is that all of our Ivy League schools here in North America are actually committed to the philosophy of relativism? That goodness is relative. Morality is relative. I said, so our young business students graduate with a relativistic ethic. And then when they become the head of Enron and live with relativistic ethics, we want to put them behind bars. They're only doing what they were taught. Don't you think you should be trying the professors as well? This is the logic of a relativistic worldview. Everything is relative. The statement doesn't make sense. If you make a statement like all truth is relative, that statement either includes itself or excludes itself. If it includes itself, that means that statement also is not always true. If it excludes itself, then it's positing an absolute while denying that absolutes actually exist. Kind of a senseless statement, but it sounds wonderful. All truth is relative. Would you want a relativist or a postmodernist for your pilot when he has nothing left but his instruments? Yeah, I know there's a dense fog. And I know this tells me I'm only 1,000 feet above, but I'm going to act as if I'm 35,000 feet above. I deconstruct reality. You don't want a deconstructionist for your surgeon. You want somebody who is a constructionist doing surgery on you, not a deconstructionist. The absoluteness, but you know, here's the problem. Where do you go for this absolute? Where do you go for this absolute? Here are two atheists giving to us their predicament. Kai Nielsen, the Canadian philosopher. I have to say, we have not been able to show that reason requires the moral point of view. Reason doesn't really decide here. The picture I have painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on this depresses me. Pure, practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. I didn't say that, he said that. Listen to Bertrand Russell. He says, I find my own views quite incredible because I cannot live as though ethical values were simply a matter of my personal taste. But I do not know the solution to my predicament. Russell, one of the best known philosophers from Australia, J.L. Mackey, he says the whole idea of morality has such an odd cluster of contingencies to it that I would have to admit, apart from a personal God, there is really no way to explain it. It's an atheist. If you visit Mahatma Gandhi's home in the city of Ahmedabad in India, I was startled to see a banner outside his home. Gandhi was a pantheist. But outside his home is this banner, the words of Bertrand Russell. Here's what he said. It is doubtful that the efforts of the Mahatma would have succeeded, except he was appealing to the conscience of a Christianized people. You hear, here is an atheist paying the pantheist a compliment, but says he wouldn't have succeeded if it weren't for the theist. You see what I'm saying? 
It is doubtful that his efforts would have succeeded, except he's appealing to the conscience of a Christianized people. Bertrand Russell said that. So I can infer that if you were appealing to the conscience of a pantheistic or an atheistic people, he'd have had a king-sized problem in front of him. He had to appeal to the mind of a Christianized conscience. You know, one of the best-known philosophers who one time taught at Harvard, psychologist, and then at Yale, and committed suicide at the age of 82, was also one time got his PhD from Johns Hopkins, and I quoted him there. Here's what he said. He said, you know, for several decades, we psychologists have looked upon the whole matter of sin and moral accountability as a great incubus and accepted our liberation from sin as epoch-making. But at length, we have discovered that to be free from sin, to have the excuse of being sick rather than being sinful, is to court the danger of losing ourselves. This danger is, I believe, betokened by the widespread interest in existentialism, which we are presently witnessing. In becoming amoral, ethically neutral, and free, we have cut the very roots of our being, lost our deeper sense of selfhood and identity, and with neurotics now have found ourselves asking, who am I? What is my deepest destiny? What does living really mean? He took his own life, the age of 82. He said, we thought it was liberating to get away from the idea of sin, but when we got away from the idea of sin, we lost our definition as to who we really are. I was speaking at a dinner in uh, November, hosted by a member of the House of Lords in, uh, in the Cotswolds. There were about 75 people from aristocracy sitting there in front, and I had to present a talk on the defense of theism. As soon as I finished, one question shot out from them, and then the second question shot out in similar fashion. A man leaned over to his left, arms folded, and he said to me, what do you mean by evil? You've used the word. Define it. I said, you want me to define evil? He said, yes. I said, may I give you my definition? He said, yes. I said, it's violation of purpose. He said, whose purpose? I said, that's what my talk was about. God's purpose. You know, he came to me afterwards, and we had surrounded, my wife was there, and some of my colleagues were there, and he said to me, he said, you know, I've stopped going to church. He said, I don't go to church because they don't give us answers anymore. He says, if I had answers like this, I'd have something to think about and something to debate in my own mind. He said, thanks for being here. And the invitation to return has come pouring in almost every second week to come there and interact with these folks, which I will be doing coming up next month once again, because the very categories of good and evil have eluded the naturalist, because once you jettison the absolute, you have no point of reference by which to define good and evil anymore. And so I say to you, if you were to ask me how God defines human worth in an absolute term, very simply, it's like this. If you were to take the Ten Commandments, there's only one word that emerges after you read the Ten Commandments. You know what that word is? Sacred. Your life is sacred. Your property is sacred. Your marriage is sacred. Your time is sacred. Your worship is sacred. And so is that of your neighbor. That's why the greatest commandment Jesus said was not one, but two. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said on these two laws hang all of the laws and the prophets. Do you know what he was referring to? There were 613 laws in the Mosaic spectrum. 613! When he was asked to give the most important, he refrained from giving one. He gave two because from the first, the second logically follows. Without the first, there is no way to hang the second anywhere or to condition it in on any ground. If you are the creation of God, your value is intrinsic and it is my obligation to love you despite your belief and despite mine. We hold each other as inviolable and sacred. If this world saw it in those terms, it would be a different world. 
So number two, incarnation, we see the absoluteness of the moral law. The second entailment is the supremacy of love. The supremacy of love. Love is the supreme ethic. Love is the supreme ethic. And if you took away all the love, love songs from the air, there'd be very few songs left. Because we all yearn for it, we all dream of it, we all long for it. You know, my son uh, has just yesterday um, celebrated his 28th birthday. And uh, we were writing back and forth. My son's a very nostalgic young man. He writes, all of his writings are on human interest stories. He'll always pick up on some little personal incident and write a beautiful little article on it. He blogs and he writes for two or three organizations. He said, you know, Dad, I'm only in my 20s. And he said, it's sad when you're younger you actually are always looking forward to the future. And now, as I've celebrated this birthday, the last year or two have been very hard on me because he had the breakup of a very good relationship that he had hoped would continue but did not. And it's been tough on him, very tough. I thought the weeks would come, the months would come and go, and he'd somehow be able to shake that off. But he hasn't been able to, and he's gradually beginning to emerge from the cloud of it but for a son to write to the father and say, it's been tough, when at the age of 28, rather than looking forward, you're looking back at the last two years and saying, it's been tough. Love is that which your heart longs for. Because of my very serious back problems at home, I get regular massage therapy. And I've talked to so many experts in the field. And I don't know how many therapists have, when I converse with them, tell me that some of the elderly who come to them for treatment come not so much for the physical side of it, but the human side of the touch. Amazing that when you get into those years of your 70s and 80s and your elderly years and you long for the touch, but you daren't really admit it lest you look vulnerable. The human heart longs for love, and the Bible is so clear, for God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his only begotten son. Love is different to compassion. Love is different to kindness. It goes beyond those. Don't mix up the terms. You can be compassionate towards somebody you don't even love. Love looks at a person of such value that it wants to give to that person the best of what it has because it is for that person's intrinsic worth that you're expressing this love. When Oscar Wilde, in my book, I mentioned this. In fact, my publisher wrote to me and said, how can you put these words into Oscar Wilde's mouth? I have a series of books of great conversations the first one was the lotus and the cross, Jesus talks to Buddha. The second was sense and sensuality, Jesus talks to Oscar Wilde. And in that book on Oscar Wilde, I mentioned the fact that while he's on his deathbed, he is with his lover sitting by his bedside, Robbie Ross. And he looks at Robbie Ross and he asks him this question. Amazingly, Wilde is dying in his 40s, this brilliant mind. And he says, Robbie, when you loved some of those young boys, did you love any one of them for their own sake? Robbie Ross said, no. He said, neither did I. And in his poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail, this great dramatist and genius an exponent of pleasure said this, only the Christ now is big enough to forgive and restore. I didn't say that. He did. The yearning for love.
So the absoluteness of the moral law and the supremacy of love. There's the creation, the incarnation, thirdly and quickly the transformation. The transformation goes something like this. The human heart, even with all of its willing, cannot ultimately solve its own dilemma. That's the Judeo-Christian worldview. You know, it's very interesting to me. Tiger Woods. My heart goes out to him. He gets caught, many others don't. He has the money, so somebody exploits him. It's like he's bad, the rest of the world is all good. But when you get so erratic in your ways, it's payday someday. What fascinated me is what he said about his faith. He said, I did not abide by the teachings that I was taught. Had I done that, I would have been okay. So he was coming back to his family, to his wife and his child, children. Do you know the interesting thing is, Gautama Buddha, on the night that his son was born, left home. Because he believed that any kind of attachment was a detriment to his pursuit of enlightenment. So while the founder of Tiger Woods' faith leaves his children as a sign of his spirituality, Tiger Woods is actually coming back to his children as a sign of his spirituality. You have to ask the question, where do we find the answer to this? How do we find it? And what it is is this. In the teaching of the Judeo-Christian faith, it is this, that the human heart is desperately wicked. That's why even the noble life lived by a man like the Dalai Lama he still pursues and seeks the liberation of his countrymen. But technically, he should not desire that. He should leave it alone. But the inner angst, the inner urge, he longs to see his own people free. You know what that says to me? No matter how much we pursue goodness, goodness will always elude us because the problem of humanity is not the absence of education. The fact of the matter is what Deal Moody said is right. If a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track and you want to change him and send him to college, at the end of his education, he will steal the whole railway track. Some of the most corrupt people in the world today are in the highest places of success. The most wealthiest, the most educated. I was doing a lectureship, I'll move to my final thought, I was doing a lectureship on ethics at a university, I won't name it because I don't want to get the student into trouble. And after it was over, the student came to me and said, uh, you know, when our professor asked you to come and speak on ethics, we were all not going to come, but she said you should come and get the Christian view on, on ethics because I've given you all the others. She said, um, actually, after your talk, I'm convinced your arguments make more sense than any of the others we've heard in the classroom. She said, but when I did my term paper, I could not give this conclusion because I know my professor would have failed me. In fact, my professor told me if you came to this conclusion, she would disqualify you. I said, which professor? She said, the one here who brought you on ethics. And the amazing thing is that professor in the middle of the question and answer session stood up and asked me this question. I'm not kidding you. She said this. You know, all the highfalutin definitions of ethics are okay, but I have a question for you, Professor Zacharias. How do you keep students from cheating? She said, that's my problem. My students are cheating all the time. How do you keep them from cheating? Well, this is the same professor who wanted to know how to keep the students from cheating who told them if they told the truth, they'll be failed. Amazing. You think I make up these stories. Fortunately, we have them on video. <laughs> it's like the son whose father was 
called into the principal's office and the father was told, your son is a thief. He's always stealing things. We need to tell you he's going to become a big thief when he grows up. So the father says, what kind of things is he stealing? He says, oh, not big things right now. It's notebooks and erasers and pencils and pens. The father says, I don't know why he'd do that. I could bring him all those from my office. I don't know why I'd be stealing it from here. And as soon as he said that, the father said, oh, brother, what have I said? Have you ever looked into your heart? I'm fascinated by people who want an explanation for evil all over the world, who never want to do with the deal with the evil that is in here. Lust, greed, pride. That's it. Lust, greed, pride. And the third is the root of all evil which brings you down to a point where you think you're all that really matters. What the Bible says is this, unless your heart is transformed by the grace of God, no amount of goodness will ever get you to the destiny for which you were created. As I said to one of the mullahs in Jerusalem, founder of one of the founders of Hamas, I said, until we receive the son God has provided for us, we'll be offering our own sons on the battlefields of this world. Unless we respond to the son God has offered to us, we'll be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world. It's history. It's replete. Creation, incarnation, transformation, and lastly, consummation. Consummation is this. In the Christian worldview, the way to begin in life is by answering the most fundamental of all questions. How do you explain unity in diversity? How do we explain unity and diversity? How we bring them together? That's why you're going to university to explain unity and diversity. You're hoping to find an answer here, to find unity and diversity. That's why universities were created. Because that was the greatest question of the Greeks. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and finally one of them came around and said there's four unities, earth, air, water, fire. But the fifth one, can, somebody else came along and said, that's four, we're looking for one. What's the quintessence, the fifth essence that unites these four essences? That's what America's looking for on every coin. E pluribus unum. Out of the many, one. Out of diversity, unity. We'll never find unity and diversity on the outside until we find unity and diversity on the inside. And what God has made you for it's for himself. And when you've learned to worship him in spirit and in truth, he brings you the fulfillment and the purpose and the meaning for which he has created you. Worship is the glue that binds together your proclivities and your dispositions with the undergirding notion of the sacred from which your decisions are made day to day. But one of, one of England's great poets is a man by the name of Francis Thompson. Creative people sometimes border very close to being the most erratic. It is not at all accidental that some of the most artistic people end up messing with drugs and all of that. It happens with the personality. Francis Thompson got messed up with opium. And he was turned down at Oxford repeatedly, so he left his home. He had a dirty raincoat that he kept around himself. He would sleep by the River Thames at night and then go to Charing Cross during the day to sell his pencils or shoelaces, make a little money in order to go and buy his drugs. He would pick up the newspapers from the dustbins and write letters to the editor and editors, but there was never a return address and one of the editors made a comment a greater than a Milton is among us, but there's nowhere to write to him. He would sleep by the River Thames, walk through the hangout with the losers and the lost in Charing Cross, making some money. Then he read the story of Jacob in the Bible and how God came down that ladder through the angel, as it were. And Francis Thompson wrote this, O world invisible, we view thee. O world intangible, we touch thee. O world unknowable, we know thee. 
inapprehensible we clutch thee. Does a fish soar to find the ocean, an eagle plunge to find the air? Do we ask of the stars in motion if they have rumor of thee there? Not whether wheeling systems darken or our benumbed conceiving sores, the drift of pinions would we hearken, beats on our own clay-shuttered doors. The angels keep their ancient places, touch but a stone and start a wing. Tis ye, tis your estranged faces that have missed the many splendored thing. But when so sad thou canst not sadder, crying upon thy so sore loss, shall shine the traffic of Jacob's ladder, pitched between heaven and Charing Cross. Yea, in the night, my soul, my daughter, cry clutching heaven by the hems. Lo, Christ walking on the water, not of Gennesaret, but Thames. Tis ye, tis your estranged faces that have missed the many splendored thing. What does it mean to be human? It means to be created in the image of God. One of my favorite songs sung by a great tenor, Kenneth McKellar. Many a time at home I listen to it and I close my eyes and he sings it beautifully. Listen carefully. I'm sure your professor is very knowledgeable in this, being a great musician and a theorist in music. Here's the words. Seated one day at the organ, I was weary and ill at ease and my fingers wandered idly over the noisy keys. I know not what I was playing or what I was dreaming then, but I touched one chord of music like the sound of a great amen. It flooded the crimson twilight like the close of an angel's psalm. It lay over my fevered spirit like the touch of infinite calm. It quieted pain and sorrow like love overcoming strife, it seemed the harmonious echo from our discordant life. It linked all perplexed meanings into one perfect peace and trembled away into silence as if it were loath to cease. I have sought, but I seek it vainly, that one lost chord divine which came from the soul of the organ and entered into mine. It may be that death's bright angel will speak in that chord again. It may be that only in heaven I shall hear that grand amen. It's that lost chord that you seek, that you long for. And he says, maybe only in heaven you'll hear that grand amen, pulling it all together. What does it mean to be human in the Judeo-Christian worldview? You're created by God. You have the incarnation in the Son. You have the transformation through the change he can bring in your heart and the consummation when you hear the grand Amen. The intimations of it can be felt now. I want you to know what an honor it is for me to be back at HKU here and to be given this great privilege to speak to you. I looked at my other colleagues and said, how come I drew the short straw and had to do it? I'd rather sit down and listen to them rather than myself. But we are all masochists at heart, and you've come to have this suffering inflicted upon you, and I want to thank you for enduring with such patience and kindness. God bless you. I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Ravi, thank you so much for that very mind-boggling and mind-provoking uh, talk. Now, quite often at uh, a, a Ravi Zacharias event, actually the most um, mind-provoking time comes during the questions time. So uh, we've left ample time for this to happen, and there's been plenty of time for you to ask your questions and to engage with Ravi. But before we do that, I just want to say a few things. First of all, this is the University of Hong Kong. So this is a neutral place. There are people from many different backgrounds here, and this means that you can ask any question 
that uh, arises from the issues that Ravi has raised today in his talk. There's no question that it's too stupid, and there's no question that you are not allowed to ask. No question is too uh, controversial here. So that's very important for us to, to grasp. Now, although I've said this, there are two rules that you have to keep. The first rule is this. You are only allowed to ask one succinct question. This is not your moment to give that sermon you've been dying to give, all right? And it's not your moment to give your philosophy of life. So please ask one short question. It doesn't have to be sweet, but it does have to be to the point. And the second rule is this. Uh, you can only ask your question if you have a microphone in your hand so that we can hear your question. And there are people with mics around the room that will give it to you if you are the chosen one. So, other questions, please put up your hand. And also, if you do ask your question, it would help if you could stand up because uh, the camera crew would like to spot you. Okay, so questions, please. It's very scary when we know there are no stupid questions, but there have been many stupid answers, so I hope I don't fulfill that. I've got my colleague Stuart with me who will back up when the tough ones come. But please don't hesitate, and we'll do our best to answer what we can. I, I don't want you to be reticent. There's one right here. This young person here on your right. Hi, my name is Ryan from the University of Edinburgh. My question relates to the beginning of your talk where you were saying that um, to believe in God, to believe in Christianity, the Judeo-Christian Judeo view, you need to have that four, um, you have to focus on the four, the, uh, the four glass, uh, the percentage in the glass, the, um, the water in the glass, you need to focus on the small part, not on this huge part. So my question would be, science tries to find out everything. And what you're saying is that we need to focus on this smaller part of this entire large concept that is life. Do you still believe, though, that scientists and those that study these large, large concepts should continue to do that to make sure that we have an adequate understanding of how big the universe is, of how large <clears throat> the idea of life is? Thank you. I appreciate it. Good question. The one, one or two things that I might fine tune to make sure, first of all, by the implication of the remaining four ounces, I was not just referring to the Judeo-Christian worldview that it would take to explain those, but that physics alone would not be able to explain, that the scientist couldn't, did not have the complete sovereignty over all those issues. The second thing that I might um, um, just also want to qualify a bit I'm not sure I would agree with the paradigm that science deals with the larger questions and that the rest of it is the smaller ones. In fact, I would reverse it. I would say those metaphysical issues are the larger ones. In fact, Stephen Hawking himself, and I had the privilege of taking some courses under him when I was there. Stephen Hawking's, Hawking ends his uh, whole book, uh, The Brief History of Time, with this incredible comment. He said, now we know the what. If we knew the why, we would have the mind of God. So this is Hawking mentioning the fact that we can deal with the particulars of materiality, but the glue that will hold this all together takes someone, you know, someone of an infinite being to define for us. The fact of the matter is in a world in which we live, when you take the six, seven billion people, however many there are, and you go into numerous societies all over the, I come from India, where there are tens of millions in villages who will probably never even know what science is teaching, what science is ex extracting for them, for whom they refer to themselves as dharti ke admi, people of the soil, for whom their children are valuable, for whom their day-to-day -day sustenance is valuable, for whom watching a child hit by an errant truck driver on the road becomes redefining of all of their lives. Science will never be able to tackle those issues for them. Science may be able to tell them how to build a truck. Science may tell them how you build your home, how you build your, um, your, your farms and so on. But science will never be able to explain to them unless it becomes purely deterministic. And why do you love your child? Why are you honoring your spouse? Why are you honoring your, your family? The ideas of truth, beauty, and goodness are very profound issues of life. 
And so I would not call them the footnotes of life, I would call them the story of life to which science is a very important footnote. Now having said that, yes, I think scientists in fact in the medieval times and so on, people like Newton and Faraday and some of those who were scientists had a very firm faith in God. What is interesting to me is to differentiate not between the scientists and the humanities as much as it between the naturalists and those who believe in a transcending worldview that explains our lives. You take Francis Collins. Francis Collins, the co-mapper of the human DNA. I know Francis Collins well. I've been with him. We've teamed up together. In fact, when I gave this talk, not identically, but the subject at Johns Hopkins, he had preceded me. And in a fascinating way, his last picturesque comment was powerful. He had talked about the 3.1 billion bits that they mapped and this and that and how it all came about. And then in his closing moment, he showed a half side of the screen and he showed a beautiful picture of a stained glass window from York Minster Cathedral. Thousands of pieces in perfect synchronicity there and he said, put together by a brilliant artist who works in that field and the people were quite wowed by it. He uncovered the other half of the screen. He said, you know what you're looking at now? Even more spectacular and he had sent me a copy of it. I have it in my library at home uh, on a slide. He said, what you're looking at now is a vertical section of the human DNA. It's a 3.1 billion bits. The audience, you could audibly hear the gasp. Perfect, beautiful looking symmetry to it. He said, this did not happen by chaos. This also happened by design. And you know what he did? Instead of responding to his own thought, he picked up a guitar and sang a chorus. And he stepped down. Francis Collins is being beaten up in the media by the scientists who deny him the privilege of being a worshiper of God. We're not beating up on them. We think science, history, music, philosophy, all these disciplines should be given the privilege of pursuit and understanding. And I mean, I'm grateful for science that has helped me with my back. I've got two metal rods holding me up. And we need that. But I also believe that I respect and admire the doctor because he's treating me with dignity and respect and we see each other as worthy human beings. Science does not give you that bequest. So the four ounces plus four ounces, this, the four ounce of science emerges from the four ounce of metaphysics. And this is what Einstein said. The problem with scientists is that we make very poor philosophers. And it was in reference to quantum that Einstein said, God doesn't play dice. It was in that context he answered the question. Stephen Hawking, when he was asked the question in a, after a lecture at the Lady Mitchell Hall in Cam Cambridge, with a quantum and all of that will one day explain everything, he said, it may explain many things, but it cannot explain everything. And I think theology and science should go hand in hand. And I think the disciplines will prosper when the respect is given to each its due. Thank you. Yes, another yeah. question, the yeah. lady in the, in the white. Hi there. Um, you mentioned that evil was a violation of God's purpose, and yet you also mentioned that to love your neighbor as yourself. How then do you love someone who is actively working against the very same purpose that you yourself hold sacred? That's the kind of question that Stuart is going to answer. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. <laughs> because it sounds more profound with a Scottish accent. And then I'll, I'll, add, a, I'll add a footnote to that too. Give his voice a little rest. How do you love, uh, how do we balance the love for someone who's contradictory to your purpose? Was that correct? Well, we don't, we don't love evil, but evil depends on our definition of getting what we mean by evil. St. Augustine talked about the fact that evil is not original. Evil is parasitic. It's an attack on the good. But let's face it that Jesus himself was the greatest example of someone who dealt with evil by showing love in the face of it. I remember hearing a number of years ago the American speaker Tony Campolo saying that if Jesus had been a Westerner and gone to the cross, he would have taken out the six gun and said, oh, come on, you know, I'll waste my enemies. 
But the fact that Jesus, with all the power of heaven, this is a confusing thing to many of us. Here is Jesus, who is the supremely good one, the supremely powerful one, has the ability by a word or whatever to destroy the, his enemies, but chooses to allow evil to exhaust itself on him. So he embraces the evil by, through his love, by, willing, by being punished by, by taking that evil to himself. The cross, if you like, turned evil upside down or inside out, destroying it. Now, for human beings like us, we don't love the evil. We love through grace if we have that power that God gives us. That's not something I can do on my, on my, on my own terms. I don't love evil as, as a thing, but I can love people who commit evil by extending grace to them, but that comes also by the mercy of God. So I think, you know, it's not that we love evil it's, or we don't uh, a, a, a love evil as a thing in itself. We, we hate evil. We despise evil. We want to see it overcome. We want to see it healed. But in Christ's in Christ coming, he turned evil inside out by turning, breaking its very power. I don't know if you are familiar with the writings of C.S. Lewis. Well, the, greater, the great picture of that, I think, is in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And you see the children, particularly when Aslan, who is brought to the witch because of the, the traitor, Edmund, who has betrayed humanity. And because of that, one must die. And Edmund must die. But the only opportunity then to save uh, Edmund's life is for Aslan to offer his life, which he does. The children don't know this story, and they see him going up there, the great king, the lion, against this witch and all the, the, the wicked evil, and they're beating her and, and pulling out, cutting off his whiskers and so forth. And finally, of course, she plunges the knife. And the children are brokenhearted because this is the end of their world, the end of the universe. But then after some time, of course, passes, and the stone table cracks, and Aslan comes off the table because he points out there was a deeper magic in the universe. And in the mystery of evil is that death has been undone in the cross. And if that is not the answer to evil, we're still left in with a mystery uh, by some other worldview has to try and answer that, but the problem doesn't go away. The Christian answer says that evil has been turned inside out and that love is possible, forgiveness and healing is possible because of what God has done through himself. So in broad strokes, that's how I would do that. Okay. You know, the fascinating thing about a question like that, which Stuart has so well approached, and Lewis does a marvelous job, as you know, when you, when you read that, <clears throat> if you are constantly exposed to evil, there's a hardening process that takes place in your life. You get weary and tired and encrusted by looking at it till you don't even see it anymore. It, it's like seeing one beggar and you feel touched, then two, you feel touched, but then you start seeing a hundred coming at you and you get worn out and say, I can't handle all of this. The story is told during the Second World War in one of the villages of France, Le Chambon, where the Nazis had done their havoc and a writer on all of this said he'd gotten completely weary and exhausted till evil did not even say anything to him anymore. But one day he saw some of the Chambonais taking some wounded Nazi soldiers and binding them up with bandages and mitigating their pain and their suffering. And in an incredible expression, he said, all of a sudden, the power of good broke the encrustation of my heart that had gotten desensitized to evil. Martin Luther King Jr., some of the greatest sermons he preached were on the cross. People often say that, you know, the West people, atheists like to say, yeah, he got a lot of his inspiration from Gandhi. Gandhi G. traveled with the New Testament all his life. He read from the Sermon on the Mount repeatedly and used Christ as his own inspiration to bless those who cursed you and so on. When William Carey got to India in the late 1700s, one of the practices of the Indian culture at that time was when a woman was widowed, she threw herself on the funeral pyre to burn herself in the process of her husband's death. It was William Carey, along with Raja Ram Mohan Roy, a great Indian leader, but it was Carey who called to an end to this by showing the value of the human life and the love that we need to have for the widow 
protect her from this kind of self-immolation. I'll give you just one more illustration of this. I was in, I won't name the country, miles and miles from here, and a young woman in her early 20s came to speak to me. She said, I don't know how to deal with this struggle. She said, when I was a little girl, my father did something very cruel to my mother. He said, my mother was a very beautiful woman, very beautiful, and my father was just an average looking guy. So he always lived with a lot of jealousy, always jealous that somebody else had come into her life or that she was not being true to him. She said, none of which was true. My mother was of such high sterling value. But the jealousy he couldn't live with. And one evening he came home from the office and had something in his briefcase unknown to his wife. He opened a bottle of acid and threw it on her face and burned her face, scarred her for life and left. And this girl, now a young woman at college, said to me, that is in my homeland, I'm studying here now. She said, I cannot tell you the anger that I have had to deal with when I look at my mother's pictures of what she looked like and what she is now. She said, the anger, I cannot deal with it. She said, but that's not why I'm here. She said, a few weeks ago, he contacted my mother after all these years because he was dying of cancer. And he was begging her to forgive him. He was all alone and destitute, had no place. And she said, it is bringing a rift in our family now because my mother is willing to take him back and nurse him in his deathbed. And we want to have absolutely nothing to do with him. She said, where do we go? I asked her why her mother did this. She said, my mother's a very devout Christian. And I said, if you take away from her the ultimate expression of the cross in her life, you will also regret it when the day comes where you look into your mother's face and find out you stifled from her what she wanted to do as an act of grace. I said, your pain has to be immeasurable, I understand. But the same love that kept you for your mother, even in her unloveliness, is the love that's working in your mother towards your father who may not be deserving of it. And in the end, at the end of the day, we are all unlovely in the eyes of God and need to be forgiven and his grace to cover us. Love will always trump evil, but it has a slower way of working as truth always does. So take that to heart and understand that in loving your neighbor, you're not being asked to celebrate your neighbor's life, but to love the person in spite of the way they choose to go. That, by the way, is the gospel message that transcends some of the other religious worldviews today, that if they don't like, the neighbor will kill. Another question? Um, the gentleman at the back there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a scientist here. Uh, I'm also a Christian as well. Um, but um, I just want to ask a question. Do you, do you believe in um, uh, natural selection and um, evolution, or do you think it's a disgrace for human being created this way? That's my question. First part, do you believe in a literal creation? Or do you, the second part was, do you believe that humans... I just want to make sure I get Na it. Natural selection and um, evolution, do you think this is the way... It may, it may be the way uh, God created us, or do you think it's a disgrace for human being being created in this way? Yeah. I appreciate you. Yeah, just stay hand on for just a moment to that microphone. You're coming as a scientist. Uh, yeah. Are you a believer in God? Uh, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. Great. Yeah. Then you have the answer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> do you want to help with that, Stuart? Do you want me to go for it? Yeah, I think Stuart. Mm -hmm. Please allow us to do this together. It gives me a little bit Give of a test for it. We are constantly, we're, as Christians and as believers, we're finding ourselves, we straddle a couple of different worlds. One is that obviously we're trying to integrate our understanding of the biblical text, its history and its interpretation, and not just one particular view. So when you come to the interpretation even of the biblical text, we know that there's a range of views, uh, and particularly to do with the Genesis story. Uh, young earth creationists, there's people old earth creationists, and then there are people the theistic evolutionists and so forth. 
But you're also then in your, in your field are people who are specialists who deal with the science and they have to go where the science is leading them as well. And then so there's the dialogue between particular interpretations of the, uh, the scripture and the, putting the best of the science together. I think this is a dialogue that we do over time. And for me, and I think for many of us, my colleagues, we are persuaded, obviously, that creation is primary. There is a God. He is a personal God. And the creation as an act of grace is in there. As to the, the timeline and the mechanics, as one of my friends who is a mathematician and a specialist says, when it comes down to the fineries, the fact is neither of us were there. Now, that's not, it's not a copy. It's just a fact. So we still try to make the best uh, explanation using the data that we have from the science and from the scripture and marrying those together. I think as I integrate, I don't see a conflict with these things necessarily. That God creates and that God uses process. A number of years ago there was uh, the, the Princeton theologians talked about the view of what they called concursus. And some Christians have a, seem to have a problem with this. That God works by means. The incarnation is the, the fusion of God and man, is the two natures. Jesus is fully God and fully man. God works in the world. His word, uh, he speaks into existence, but he also uses process. So I don't feel that there needs to be any unnecessary conflict as we search with our limited understanding to try and find the harmony. There is a harmony there, maybe not in all the fine tuning of the details, but in the big things that we know who we are in the terms of the purpose that has been initiated, the processes, we can also endorse some of that. Um, I personally, and I think we'd have the problem between separating probably with macro and micro evolution, and those, 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 as many would. Um, but if you want to look at that even to further your conversation, there's three different kind of groupings of websites. One would be the uh, Young Earth Creation View of uh, Ken Ham and, and those are answers in Genesis. There would be uh, uh, Reasons to Believe, which covers uh, Hugh Ross, who's an astrophysicist. And then there would be Biologos Foundation, which takes more of a kind of a theory. And in that, you can see people having the debate, the dialogue. For us as Christians, the primary issue that we cannot debate and we will not give up on is that God is his creative act. The processes we may not fully understand completely, but we dialogue in an ongoing way, the tension between scripture and with science. So I hope that's not too much of a fudge. But that's a, a rough way, of, at least I would come at it. Thanks, Stuart. Let me give you, <clears throat> again, based on what Stuart has stated here, that I think it is very easy to get bogged down in the minutiae of all of this. But let me take you through about four thoughts here, <clears throat> but precede it with this one comment. What C.S. Lewis said is very interesting. He said, a chicken that came from no egg is no less miraculous than a chicken that has existed from eternity. When you look at science's model of origins, you go back prior to the Big Bang to a singularity. <clears throat> and when they ask you to define a singularity, they will tell you that it is at a point at which the laws of physics actually completely break down. The laws of physics are not pertinent at that point. It is compressed down to a singularity. So whether we like it or not, prior to the Big Bang, they too are in a non-scientific realm where the laws of physics don't apply. So theirs too is a non-scientific starting point when you think about it, the very concept of origin. So when you move to the philosophical side of it, <clears throat> no matter how you section physical concrete reality, no matter how you break it down, you will always end up with a state of affairs where the quantity you're dealing with does not explain its own existence. No physical quantity in this world, as far as science has conveyed to us, explains its own existence. It always is either caused by another or dependent or a confluence both diachronic and synchronic, the, the through time and the synchronicity is needed. All these arguments are, are brought into weigh in on this. No matter how you section physical concrete reality, you end up with a state of affairs where the quantity does not explain its own existence. Stage one. Stage number two. Whenever you see any intelligibility, you always assume an intelligence behind it. Always. For example, if I were to uh, walk into another planet 
and uh, I were to see one million stones in a perfect triangle, and I was there with my son, we could argue day and night. I could say, son, somebody has come and put this together. There's no way you could have a perfect triangle after three billion years like this and so on. And he says, dad, it can happen within time plus matter plus chance. All of this can happen. I say, okay, it can happen. And then we walk beyond and there's a piece of paper. And there's a paper, we open it, and he said, hi, Ravi and Nathan. I was wondering when you would show up. One statement. He will not argue that that happened over three billion years of ink coming together because there's intelligibility. And that's the point that Francis Collins really tries to make. You've got 3.1 billion bits of information. He said it's the book of life. So now stage one, no physical quantity explains its own existence. Stage two, whenever you see intelligibility, you always see an intelligent cause behind it. Stage three, when you look at the human experience in history and the nature of morality and religious expression and so on, you see the invasive force of a transcendent being in the minds of humanity. Who is God? He is the only one who can explain his own existence because he's a non-physical quantity. He is an intelligent person who has revealed himself in the human mind. So God then is the uncaused, intelligent being who has come into history. That's who God is. So the paradigm to me, even from scientific realms, is a better explanation of those three stages than a pure naturalistic framework. We could tell you whether we take a literal view of Genesis 1 to 3 or a figurative view, which was also an important part of your question. I have my views on that. I have my thoughts on that. Stuart has his, our team has different ultimate perspectives on the details, but the fact of the matter is we really don't get bogged down in those issues with each other. We get to the point of a first cause. I've had David Block, a great astronomer from the University of Witzwaterstrand in Johannesburg, John Lennox from Green College in Oxford University, one of our colleagues, he's a triple doctorate, um, David Bloch, a renowned scientist, Hugh Ross, an astrophysicist. All of these men, great in their field, will hold slightly different views of those very three chapters right in the beginning, but they are all committed to the God of the scriptures and totally submit to his role in their lives. I would recommend for you uh, the book by John Lennox, Has Science Buried God? and he deals with these issues there. So together what has been said on macro, micro, and you put this explanation of a non-scientific starting point, even for the scientists, and you'll see that we are not as far off as we sometimes appear to be. Yep. We have time for one or maybe two questions, depending how long you speak for. So um, let's have uh, the lady there in the, in the gray. My name is Sophie and I'm a politics student. Um, I would just like to ask, with reference to something you said earlier on, about that um, uh, each of us have the right to um, the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and I was just wondering, um, on what grounds do um, people from the Is uh, Islamic faith, um, why would they disagree with this? I'd like to know. Is it anything to do with perhaps um, in reference to um, uh, people today trying to think that Islam has something to do with um, an aggressive nature um, or anything to do with that? That's a very good question. Thank you very much. A lot of, like any of the, the different views are taken by a different worldview, particularly, say, Islam, as you mentioned. Islam will find its primary authority and its stream within the Quran and within the Hadith and the Sunnah, the sayings and the life of the Prophet. So in question of how the polity is framed in the view of man or woman, their intrinsic value, or otherwise, goes back to their story. And it's a very different cosmology within the Quran than it would be, say, in the Bible or in the Declaration of Independence, for that matter. So man is obviously, lives, finds himself before Allah. And there, his existence is defined as, I mean, the word Islam means to submit. 
So the, the whole idea of finding personal dignity and value, there would be value in poetry and music and other, but it wouldn't be expressed politically in the same sense of rights and values the way it has been worked out through the Western tradition or from the biblical and then through the enlightenment uh, kind of understanding of that. So am I getting into the territory of where you were, you were asking or? The question of freedom. Uh, yes, I think um, special emphasis was put on um, life and liberty, and um, I just um, I would just have a bit of a problem with that. I just I've read the Quran, and I was actually struck by the similarities between the Bible and the Quran, um, rather than the differences. And I would like to know why special emphasis was put on life and liberty, specifically. It's a great question, and um, our team spends an awful lot of time in the Quran, with the Quran, and with Islamic scholars. And there would be many Islamic scholars who would say to you, there's a world of a difference between the Quran and the, and the Bible. Let me give you just one very fundamental difference. Muslims do not believe that Jesus actually died on the cross. They believe it appeared as if he died. He did not actually die. They do not believe in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. They do not believe that God has a Son who was sent for our salvation. In fact, they consider it blasphemous to even put an equality with God. The Muslim will say it's the ultimate sin to, that God has an equal. The Trinity is completely debunked and actually misunderstood by them. They do not subscribe to the doctrine of the Trinity. Number four, they don't even believe we have the Bible. So you can't even say they are similar to a true Muslim. The Muslim will actually say to you, we don't have the, the New Testament. The, the original New Testament was lost. So the point is moot. To see a similarity, they would have to accept that the text is authentic. They don't accept that the text is authentic. They believe the New Testament is actually lost. And what we have now is a spurious version of it. When I, I wrote a book called Light in the Shadow of Jihad and spent three and a half hours with a leading Islamic scholar at Bethlehem University in Israel. And then with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, spent two to three hours with him. At one point I said to the professor of Islamics at Bethlehem, by the way, he was a very courteous man, very kind man. I said to him, <clears throat> you often quote Muhammad as saying that there is no compulsion in religion. He said, yes, there isn't. I said, whose picture is that on your credenza behind you? <clears throat> he said, that's my daughter. I said, how old is she? He said, 22. I said, what would you do if she became a Christian or followed another faith? He looked at me across the desk and he said, without any expression on his face, I would kill her. I said, let me get this straight. You would kill your daughter? He said, let me put it this way to you. I would do everything in my power to keep her from leaving Islam to go to any other belief. But if she did, I would turn her over to the religious authorities to take her life. I've, I said, do I have your permission to quote you on that? From there, I went and spent three hours with the Grand Mufti. You would have a very hard time convincing the Grand Mufti and Islamic scholars that they actually believe in freedom. They don't. There's a new book written out, brand new book written, by a man called Tariq Fateh, who's a very moderate Muslim and absolutely brilliant. He's a Canadian of Pakistani Indian descent living in Toronto. And his book is called Chasing the Mirage. He gives you the storyline. This is a Muslim, by the way, devout Muslim, so he's not a Christian. Discussing Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan in one category, and other Muslim countries in another category. He describes Saudi Arabia, Iran, and uh, Pakistan as Islamic states. The others he puts in as states of Islam. He said, and there's a difference. He said, in the Islamic state, there's an imposition. 
you cannot you cannot depart from the faith and he talks about Saudi Iran and uh, Pakistan where you could pay with your life according to their Sharia law and so on but the states of Islam like Malaysia and Indonesia and so on it's a wonderful division of ideas it is simply not true do you know today in Malaysia the reason for the burnings of churches and mosques and other places is because the Muslims are passing a law that we cannot, nobody else can even use the word Allah because it's their private possession of the description. And what I say to you is, you, when you read the Quran, there are two statements Muhammad made that are absolutely fascinating apart from the chapters Surah 5, which is steeped in violence reaction, the last words of Muhammad when he died, the last words of Muhammad, according to all of the Hadith, perish the Jews and Christians, there shall be no two faiths in Arabia. Last words. Which means there's a monopoly and a monolithic nature to it. And he made these two statements, which were given to me, known to my steward. I'd like you to read our book called um, Beyond Opinion. In that, there is a chapter by a former terrorist who goes with a pen name now. He, he'll quote to you the Quran by the hour. And he has described what he sees in the Quran that is so dramatically different to any other religions of the world. And he brings two statements to bear in a discussion. Muhammad said this, all war is deceit. Elsewhere, all life is a war. You put the two of them together and the logic will explain to you the underpinning ethic is very different. Your choice may be to say something like this, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, they're not good Muslims. But if you believe that the leadership there are good Muslims, then the Islamic State that they have imposed would have to be within the orb of Islam. And I don't know of anybody who would stand up and say that the Grand Muftis are not good Muslims when the Sharia law is imposed upon millions of people. The five prerequisites are imposed and there are many, many other things I could tell you. So I do not believe the Islamic worldview believes in liberty at all. I think very completely different and as for the pursuit of happiness, I do not believe that. It is, uh, I'll just close with this. Stuart could give you a brilliant answer on this. He's being very kind and giving me the microphone longer here. We were together, courtesy of Stuart, who has got a program going that we call Scholars with a Dream, SWAD, where he is overseeing 20 scholars from around the world who are at a PhD level of research in the Hadith and the Quran. A paper was presented there historically on, does the word dhimmi mean anything to you? Dhimmi is a very famous Islamic doctrine. It is the non-Muslims who live in dhimmitude under Muslims. And you go back all the way to the times of uh, the Osman and the Pact of Omar uh, in Syria. What the dhimmi is, those who are non-Muslims, how they were to live under Muslim law. He presented a paper on dhimmitude and the hadith, what it says about dhimmis. Anybody who would after that say there is no difference would have to be actually choosing to deny historical fact after historical fact after historical fact. The greatest turning today to Christ, believe it or not, apart from China, is taking place in a land like Iran, land like Egypt, where I spoke there some time ago to packed overflow crowds and Muslim young men and women who will come and tell you what the difference is and how they see it. I love my Muslim friends. I'm grateful to them for giving me the permission to come. The chief of security and his intelligence in Syria told me, we know who you are, we know what you teach, we know what you speak, and you are welcome in our country anytime. Just don't get into politics.
I said, I won't. So we love them, we have cordial discussions, but no Muslim scholar looking at the New Testament and the Quran will say there's very little difference. I'm afraid we've run out of time now, but I want to thank, well, first the audience for asking great questions. Also to Stuart McAllister and to Ravi Zacharias for giving great answers, and also to Ravi for his wonderful talk. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And thank you, Ravi and Stuart. Thank you very much. Thank you.